Next paper is Patterns of Adaptive Behavior in the Uari Mountain Region, Developing Archaeological Resource Along a 22-Mile-Long Corridor in Stanley and Montgomery Counties, and it's presented by Shane Peterson of the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Good morning. Uh, I suspect that um, some folks are probably thinking now that the uh, highway paper's up, it's a good time for a bathroom break. But um, <clears throat> if you can bear with me for a little while, uh, maybe not as little as you would hope, uh, I'll try to cut uh, some of the techno-bureaucrat jargon out about roads and talk with you uh, a bit about creating narratives. So a long time ago, when I was still a grad student studying in the Bronze Age Aegean, my mentor, John Younger, told me that part of the job of an archaeologist was creating credible narratives about the past. So today, I've been asked to talk to you about my attempts to create such a narrative through DOT's work in the Piedmont, and the work of lots of folks that have been absolutely critical in that attempt. Maybe I can list some of you into this process in the future. So in a sense, this talk about creating a narrative is going to begin with its own narrative. I think it's important to begin with an understanding of the scale that transportation archaeology can operate on. In 2011, I examined the role of transportation projects in the North Carolina Piedmont. And at the time, based on the reports on file at OSA, I estimated that nearly 431,000 acres of the North Carolina Piedmont had been subjected to archaeological survey of some kind. Almost 89,000 acres of that total were surveyed as a result of transportation projects alone. Archaeology focuses on the material remains of the past from the perspective of form, space, and time. And sometimes that focus can be pretty narrow. But transportation archaeology often operates on a large scale with lots of stuff over a large area. And the, that palimpsest of stuff can represent a very large expanse of time. The series of projects in Stanley and Montgomery counties associated with proposed improvements to NC24, NC27, and the PD River Bridge provided an opportunity to look at such a large piece of space and time, a huge slice through the heart of the URI's region. When the environmental study started to gear up for the, for the proposed improvements along NC24 and 27 between Albemarle and Troy in 2005, a study corridor ranging from 260 to 500 feet wide over the 22-mile-long project area was created. In all, over 1,300 acres of land containing natural and cultural systems were to be subject to detailed scrutiny in preparation for the infrastructure changes. When the first two projects, the 15 miles between Albemarle and the west of Troy, came to me, I began planning a huge survey methodology to provide consistency in results and analysis along the entire corridor. My friend Jesse Zinn planned the seven-mile Troy Bypass, located on the end of my corridor, to match in methodology and analysis. From 2006 through 2008, this combined study corridor was surveyed by archaeologists with URS Corporation and Coastal Carolina Research, who conducted intensive surveys that included full examination of all areas and subsurface testing on 30-meter intervals. This work identified 120 archaeological sites, including 111 archaeological deposits with one or more prehistoric components. Of these prehistoric sites, two sites exhibit PD components, four were identified as late woodland period components, four contained middle woodland Yadkin artifacts, five sites had late archaic Savannah River points, four sites possessed middle archaic components, five included early archaic points, and one Paleo-Indian Dalton point was reported at one of the sites. This amounts to 25 Native American components that can be generally assigned to a particular cultural period. This range covers a very wide stretch of time, about 9,000 years. The vast majority of these sites, however, lacked artifacts that could be compared to a temporal index. 95 sites were recorded as unidentified prehistoric sites. Mostly, these are lithic scatters, but one or two sites also produce ceramics that couldn't be assigned to any particular series. Thirteen sites in the collection were described as exhibiting material associated with lithic, pro, uh, excuse me, lithic raw material procurement, like a quarry, or raw material processing workshops. So when you look at the data set as a whole, it's pretty clear that these sites represent several partial settlement systems for native peoples in the Uari region, and that a large part of the evidence for those patterns should be accessible through the remains of stone tool technologies. <clears throat> 
Because this work was undertaken as a result of the impending highway improvements, these studies, like all archaeological investigations associated with cultural resource management, were focused on the identification, evaluation, and when necessary, mitigation of effects to archaeological resources associated with government actions. There are a whole host of cultural resource laws, executive orders, and regulations, but without getting into them in any detail, I think it's fair to say that generally, they dictate that actions taken on behalf of the public should take into consideration their effects to cultural resources, like archaeological sites. The most common way this has manifested itself in practice is the identification and assessment of archaeological resources for their worthiness to be included in the National Register of Historic Places. Seven sites out of the 120 identified in the combined NC-24-27 corridor were considered eligible for the National Register. These sites include the rather large woodland tool production and maintenance component at 31MG-1806, the even larger site at 31MG-1629 near Roberto Bog that produced middle woodland uh, Yadkin artifacts, middle archaic Mora Mountain points, and a late Paleo-Indian Dalton point. The collection of early and middle archaic artifacts with PD components near Horse Trough Mountain at 31MG321. The pair of middle and late woodland lithic workshops linked to the same nearby quarry. And the diverse multi-component lithic workshop designated 31MG1910. These seven sites representing five separate resources were determined to be eligible for the National Register for their potential significance of the information they contained. The evaluation of what has become known as significance in relation to the National Register has become the essential deciding point for which sites are avoided, which sites are ignored, and which sites receive extra attention. So by the end of 2008, we had a sample of 111 archaeological sites with prehistoric components and a subset of seven sites that would be set aside for much more intensive archaeological investigation. Interesting, uh, interestingly, all of the sites determined for the National Register, or National Register eligible, excuse me, possessed temporal components that were identified across the entire project corridor. This smaller subset of sites would receive additional attention, could be considered to be representative of the broader collection of sites. As the highway schedules moved forward, I was tasked with making decisions on how to proceed with the pieces set by the archeological survey. One of the major criticisms of compliance archeology span that had concerned me over the years was the allegation that it usually operates without an overarching research design. Some researchers have argued in the past that compliance archaeology's ad hoc approach to identifying resources was severely eroding the potential for serious regional research. While I've never subscribed to the idea that compliance archaeology is inherently detrimental to such research, I began wondering if there were ways to better move compliance archaeology closer to the needs of the ar larger archaeological community. Because compliance surveys are generalist by necessity, methodologies aren't usually tailored to any particular research agenda. Compliance archaeological reports may often seem to some like cultural resource inventories that substitute a rather vague set of significance criteria for any sort of real analytical, uh, analytical vigor. To be fair, however, there hasn't seemed to be an up-to-date, well-publicized pool of regional research agendas to apply to transportation archaeological surveys. As the NC-24-27 studies were wrapping up, I approached several of the private archaeological firms that have worked with DOT and folks at OSA to try and pull together a symposium at the Southeastern Archaeological Conference. The objective was to look at ways compliance archaeology and transportation settings could serve broader archaeological research goals. Presenting the challenge of the NC-24-27 projects in the symposium, Matt Jorgensen and I looked back to the 1999 uh, URA Lithics Conference, the precursor to these discussions today, to establish a rough outline of the regional research agenda for the URAs. It was our contention that these discussions laid out key issues and, <clears throat> and uh, the largest difficulties to our understanding of prehistory, uh, prehistory in the region. Unsurprisingly, <clears throat> Given the nature of the most important archaeological resources and research that have been centered in the URAs, most of these issues resolve around understanding the lithic material in this portion of the Carolina ter uh, terrain. See, I called it the right thing. <laughs> I had to change it on the fly, so there you go. Uh, and how prehistoric economies adjusted over time to make use of it. If the mitigation of impacts to archaeological resource must be tied to the significance of the site to potential research, then the next step for the NC-2427 corridor should be making that linkage between what makes those seven sites significant 
and important, and the topics outlined by the regional research agenda for the URIs. The issue of significance in compliance archaeology has been a hot topic in the past, and I think it's important to note that there has been some conflation of the idea of archaeological importance and eligibility for the National Register. The value of an archaeological resource is not the same as its eligibility for the register. These issues are separate, but complementary. One important aspect of this difference is the important archaeological information can be obtained from sites that are not eligible for the National Register. These 104 prehistoric sites that were not selected for mitigation can still provide critical information to our understanding of those seven significant sites and for the larger set of issues we're calling our research agenda for the URIs. Jorgensen and I argued back in 2008 that the key to understanding human behavior at all of these sites, the significant ones and the ones that did not reach the necessary level of national register significance, would be an interpretive model fashioned out of the matrix of landscape resources and technology observed in the archaeological record. 2013, it became clear that the easternmost seven-mile section of the Troy Bypass would move forward first. 23 sites had been investigated in that portion of the corridor, but only the large lithic workshop at 31 MG 1910 had been recommended as eligible for the National Register. Estimated at roughly an acre in size and situated on a ridge toe that had been subjected to lumber clearing at least once in recent history. Even from just the survey level data, the site appeared to have been subjected to soil deflation and a number of post-depositional site disturbances. But the site possessed high concentrations of lithic artifacts, an intriguing diversity of material, and at least the suggestion of some degree of archeological stratification. In other words, it seemed to be pretty representative of some of the larger lithic scatters found across the Piedmont. Up to that point, the research had taken on a logical progression from the formulation of a research agenda to the collection of prioritized data, <coughs> with the next step to be the creation of a contextual framework for the interpretation of that data. A deeper understanding of the behaviors fossilized at 1910 would be gained by the framework while concomitantly, that framework would be further informed by the refined data recovered from further investigations at the site. Thus, the current undertaking for the URIs project has a binary aspect. The recovery of additional information from 1910 that can produce leads uh, regarding the role of the site and others like it in the region, and the development of an overarching interpretive framework for pre-Columbian settlement systems in the URIs including 1910's po uh, excuse me, possible place in that framework. The initial framework was conceived as resting on an extensive, though not necessarily exhaustive, reference document summarizing previous research. Alongside this reference document, the framework would require a substantial GIS database, including physical, biological, geological, and archeological data that could be used to create scalable geomorphic zones to serve as the matrix for observing behavioral patterns. Of course, this framework would need to be wedded to the existing regional culture history to provide a temporal scale and to be able to make sense of the existing archaeological record. This effort was begun by the staff at CCR in the late summer of 2014. Establishing a study area that encompassed 15 hydrologic units centered on the URIs, estimated in an area of roughly 375,000 acres, CCR staff began collecting the GIS data that would serve as the matrix of the, of the database. At the present time, CCR has assembled a GIS database that includes 28 layers. Among the more critical pieces of the database are the archaeological site locations, as recorded the Office of State Archaeology and the United States Forest Service. The delineated study area incorporates 2,141 archaeological sites, covering temporal periods from the Paleo-Indian to the contact period Native American components. Uh, integrating this information in the database in such a way as to enable uh, to create those scalable geomorphic zones has been a Herculean task. With most sites having been recorded before GPS units were commonly available, and some sites being recorded as center points instead of boundaries, there were frequent discrepancies between site locations in the reports, the site forms, and those on the maps on file. It certainly gave everybody a far greater appreciation for the work Sam Franklin's been doing to try and get all of these sites across the state digitized. Because some of these site location discrepancies couldn't always be reconciled, varying levels of reliability were coded into the database as well. Together, these layers should allow for the creation of that initial matrix of environmental and archaeological factors that can be queried to look for patterns. The second part of the uh, effort centered on investigations at uh, 31MG 1910. 
As with any survey and evaluation effort, researchers are still left with the rough outlines of a site's character. So the first thing excavators were tasked with was uh, gaining a far greater understanding of the vertical and horizontal distribution of artifacts to establish functional and temporal differentiation of assemblage components. Beginning in early December 2014, the staff at CCR began excavating a series of one by one meter test units across the ridge dough where the site was located to get a better picture of the vertical and horizontal differentiation of cultural material across the site. From these initial investigations, additional one by one meter test units were placed across the site and some units were expanded to further examine subsurface features and to gain a greater perspective on the core of activities at the site. The excavation suggested a site where a good deal of soil deflation and bioturbation are likely to have caused mixing of the original depositional components. These conditions were confirmed by the consulting geologist Keith Saramer in mid-January. But based on microtopography and the nature of the post-depositional disturbances, <coughs> it seemed possible that the relative horizontal positions of the cultural material across the landform remained intact. That is to say, while temporal Strati uh, temporal stratigraphy might not have remained preserved within the soil profile, cl uh, clustered materials across the landform may still reflect relatively discrete depositional events. The trick then began finding ways to differentiate the deposits as they lay horizontal across the site. In the core of the area, this, these deposits were likely to involve a high degree of overlap without a clear connection between portions of the assemblage and particular index artifacts. <coughs> this problem appeared daunting. One possible solution came from the very initial guide to visual identification of lithic materials that Heather and Philip uh, were presenting to you guys today. This past March, Phil and Heather were kind enough to meet with my NCDOT colleagues and with CCR staff to talk about the ways their system might be practically applied to the assemblage from 1910. It was clear, even from a cursory look at the materials in the field, that different raw material sources were being used, and then some horizontal differentiation was apparent. As I present this narrative to you, the researchers at CCR have been working very hard to determine what these differences might be, if they're quantifiable, and ultimately, ultimately what they might mean. This is probably a good place to really plug Heather and Phillips' methodology. Um, Susan told me, uh, Susan Bayman told me that despite the little, uh, being a little intimidated by the process, CCR staff has become increasingly comfortable with it in the lab and their super preliminary results sound pretty exciting. It's still early in that process and as anybody who's ever conducted any archeological research knows, things rarely turn out to be clear and simple. I suspect that one of the problems that will need to be dealt with is the temporal scale. Even if differentiation of the material in the lab is successful as we think it might be, the period of occupation at 1910, based on the recovery of some corner notch points and some possibly leak phase pottery, probably covers the early archaic through the PD expression in the woodland period. But with, exception, with the exception of the PD ceramics, diagnostic points seem fairly spread out across the site rather than concentrated in particular locations. Even if associations can be made between artifact concentrations and projectile points, the scale represented by the index artifacts may not be fine enough to capture the temporal relationship between behaviors represented at the site. The high diversity of raw material suggest, uh, suggested by the survey level investigations and the lower diversity of tool types seen in an early look at the assemblage may suggest repeated use of the site for similar activities over time. It's possible that the raw material identification process may allow the staff at CCR to identify particular reduction events and characterize the types of activities that occurred at that location. This collection of raw material types, activities, and index artifacts can be seen as a site profile for 1910 and can be linked to the geomorphic zone that that site location occupies. When other similar profiles are observed or sites identified in the same categories of geomorphic zones, these components can then be compared. The creation of a large GIS database full of sites should give us the ability to create geographic stratification along numerous criteria from the slope aspect of a landform to distance from recorded quarry locations, some of which can also be categorized by cultural component. Theoretically, associations can be drawn between these components with index artifacts and those without them. The database is always being, uh, also being constructed with layers of reliability based on our confidence in the recorded information. <coughs> 
the data set from the NC2427 study corridor, was constructed so that we have the greatest confidence and conclusion based on it. Hypotheses developed out of the GIS database and informed by the reference document can be examined in greater detail using that data and even the assemblages themselves. This process should allow us to develop strong research designs as part of the mitigation efforts on the remaining National Register eligible sites. Ideally, other research, such as research being conducted in the URA National Forest, can continue to add or challenge the database and hypotheses that come out of it, making the process even stronger. In this way, we hope to begin teasing a clearer look at settlement patterning, raw material use, and human ecology in the study area. And then, if we've done a good job, we hope to have a narrative of prehistory in the URAs. I have one uh, sort of final note that I'm going to leave you with, and, and I'm going to have to break another promise uh, to avoid using some DOT jargon. Um, this archaeological research effort is driven by the highway projects, and, and as such, uh, the project schedule dictates our pace. If you follow the news way more deeply than you probably should, then you know that the State Transportation Improvement Project list was recently, recently released with a new effort to reprioritize highway projects. While the Troy Bypass Project is underway, uh, the rest of the Montgomery County portion of the NC2427 project is currently unfunded through 2030. And that means unless something uh, drastic uh, changes, which certainly could happen, none of those four Montgomery County sites are going to get any additional work anytime soon. On the other hand, the Stanley County portion of the project is funded, and I expect within the next year and a half I'll be planning research to take a look at the lithic economy of a very small portion of our study area in much finer deca detail. In closing, I'd like to thank everybody that's been involved in this long research effort so far. My colleagues at NCDOT, the amazing staff at OSA, the brilliant folks at the State Geologic Survey, and the great staff at CCR and URS, and my family, who's had to listen to this on a much more informal, much more detailed, and much more colorful version of this paper over the years. <coughs> uh, this is an attempt at building a narrative, and certainly it's been far more difficult than I could have hoped to accomplish by myself. Uh, so I'll be looking for more help as this moves forward, and it's probably going to be yours. So thank you.